Hello, and welcome to this emergency edition of the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away Friday night from complications of metastatic pancreatic cancer, creating an opening on the Supreme Court 46 days before Election Day. Ginsburg was a feminist and liberal jurisprudence icon, and her death is, of course, upsetting to many. It also poses various questions about American politics going forward. So we're going to try to clarify what we can. But of course, a lot of this we don't quite have answers to yet. So at least we'll lay out what those questions are. And here with me to do that are Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, good morning. Managing Editor Micah Cohen. Hey, Micah. Hey, Galen. Hey, everybody. And Politics Editor Sarah Frostenson. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Galen. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me on this Saturday morning. I know we all had other plans that we are going to be doing right now. And I'll also say that there are plenty of great retrospectives on Ginsburg's life and legacy. For our purposes today, we're going to be focusing on the process going forward and how it shapes the election and politics more broadly. And I think the most immediate question at the top of people's minds is, What happens next? What indication do we have from President Trump, Leader McConnell, and other senators about how they are proceeding with this Supreme Court vacancy? Sarah, if you could kick us off. Right. So last night, McConnell was meeting with fellow Republicans in the Senate to go over uh, their plans moving forward with a nominee. Trump this morning tweeted that he plans to fill the vacancy as soon as possible. So I think we can expect here in the next few days a nominee to emerge. You know, there was the updated short list of nominees that he published Earlier in September here, 45 nominees, Barrett's name has floated to the top. Republicans, despite the hypocrisy people have highlighted from McConnell not moving forward with Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, seems intent to move their own nominee and swear them in before the election, at least at this point. Whether that happens, that's an entirely open question that I'm sure we'll debate today, but that seems to be the direction that Republicans are moving in at this point. Hypocrisy, Sarah. What do you mean? There, there's a big difference here. Merrick Garland, the Senate and White House were controlled by different parties. This is they both if Republicans control both of them. It's totally different. I mean, it is totally different because oftentimes in politics, you do what you have the power to do. And exactly. Republicans <laughs> have the power to block Merrick Garland in 2016. And they have the power to approve someone now. I mean, isn't that how American politics works? Or is that is that uh, too cynical? No, it is how American politics works. But American politics, I think, as Sarah was saying, um, are incredibly hypocritical. And basically anything anyone says, you should not believe. Our politics are broken, man. Game over, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but it is. It is. Sorry. Allow me like one little rant. It is like the latest in a long line of examples of why, like, I don't think political journalists should treat what any politician says as at all meaningful in any way. Like, you should start from the assumption of just like, they're going to do what they're going to do, what they can do, as you said, Galen, and not put a lot of stock in the arguments they make. Okay, so I mean, there is there is a cynical about let me, hold American on, let politics. Me, I feel like we do that at 538. But let me, y'all are missing a big element here. Okay. Go um, since we kind of are a site that often talks about elections, right? Elections are a big element in this, including how will people react to perceived norm breaking, right? Um, if a bunch of polls come out showing that Democrats have won this argument that, hey, you definitely shouldn't confirm someone before the next election, right? Then more Republicans might lose their Senate seats and they pay a price for that. Um, if the public doesn't care, then there might be less of a trade-off for Mitch McConnell. So, um, you know, the check and balance here ultimately is elections. Ultimately is also the fact that, you know, in the Senate where you have two senators in Wyoming and two senators in California, that creates a pretty huge rural skew in the Senate relative to the population as a whole. Um, And with the GOP currently being the party that does better with rural voters, um, creates a pretty big GOP skew in the Senate too. So, um, you know, so it's all mechanics of like, how long can you maintain your position in power? And that comes down to the structure of the system and the GOP advantage in the Senate. 
So let's talk a little bit about what is going to happen between now and Election Day. Nate, you said that it somewhat depends perhaps on what the polling shows. But when it comes down to those mechanics, Republicans have a 53 seat majority in the Senate. They can lose three votes and have Pence break a tie. They can't lose four votes. What possible defectors are there from any movement to replace Ginsburg before the election? And how likely is it that they would defect? Well, in theory, you'd have two groups of defectors, one of which might be people who objected on the process side and one of which might um, kind of be more electorally interested, kind of senators from purple states. Um, So in the former group, you'd have people like Senator Mitt Romney, Lamar Alexander, Chuck Grassley, maybe the former incarnation, not the current one, of Lindsey Graham. Um... In the latter camp, you would have certainly Susan Collins and Cory Gardner, who are the two Republican senators from Hillary Clinton won states, Um, but also Martha McSally, Tom Tillis, maybe Joni Ernst, right? The thing is, though, a lot of those Republicans are, you know, they were kind of elected by the conservative movement. Um, Only Susan Collins of that group has really shown any tendency toward... um, Moderation. There's also Lisa Murkowski, who um, is in a pretty red state, but is moderate. She's kind of her own um, her own thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I don't know, I mean, no one knows how popular this is going to be or unpopular it's going to be, right? Ordinarily, you'd say, okay, um, Martha McSally is in a increasingly purple, maybe even increasingly blue state, right? Um, she has failed to differentiate herself from Trump, and that's why she's losing by eight or nine points in some of these polls. And now would be a great opportunity to do it. But she has, I think, already come out and said she supports, um, we don't know the nominee is, right, but supports the process at least, right? Because it is the Supreme Court, I think it is something that, like, actually Republicans deeply believe in. Like, we're going to just get all types of huge victories over this for many decades um, as a result of confirming this person. And so maybe that outweighs their electoral incentives, um, maybe they think there isn't a trade-off yeah. that'll motivate the base, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, Occam's razor is that, like, this is something the party would be willing to make sacrifices for. Um, and so they will both get it, because they can get it if they want it, and they would pay some type of political price, right? How steep, I mean, potentially, we don't, we, don't, we don't know that yet. We don't right? know, and it, maybe not. Sarah, maybe they are right, but yeah. Sarah and Micah, do you have thoughts about the process going forward? And any possible defections, as Nate mentioned, or things that Democrats could do to complicate or upset the process? I mean, you know, other people have said this, but I think it's right. Democrats only leverage here, really, because I don't think there will be enough defections um, to, 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 to really get in the way of Republicans doing this. Although, you know, we'll wait and see. Um, but Democrats only real leverage here is the possibility that they will win the Senate um, in November and then, you know, there will be retribution if Republicans push this through. So Democrats could add justices to the court, right? They could get rid of the filibuster. They could do all kinds of big structural things to try to, from the Democratic point of view, even things out in response to what Democrats see as norm-breaking moves, what have been norm-breaking moves, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't attribute that to Democrats, um, by Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans. That's really, I think that's their only their only leverage here. They could make a very compelling argument and and convince the American people that pushing this through is wrong. But, you know, what, what Nate said about the skew of the Senate is right. Confirming Kavanaugh was, was net unpopular. Senate Republicans did that. Uh, they kept they kept the chamber right. This I, I would expect this to be net unpopular. We'll wait and see, and yet to still not have. There's not a one to one relationship between that and the electoral effect. I would expect the electoral effect to be muted and perhaps even reversed by by at the state level. You know, a lot of the a lot of the close races right now are in red states. So there's a couple things here that I think make it really hard to understand how the process would go in the sense that, to some extent, I think Trump has 
the desire not to fill the seat before the election to drive up the base. But on the other hand, you know, one of the lasting legacies of the Trump administration, at least on the federal um, judiciary level, will be how many justices he has appointed. And then, of course, you know, the two on the Supreme Court as well, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, and this would be a third. And as Perry Bacon wrote in our piece uh, for the site last evening, you know, a 6-3 conservative majority on the court, that would be huge in shifting law in America to the right. The fact that Ginsburg said on her deathbed that her most fervent wish is that she will not be replaced until a new president is installed is something that Democrats will latch on to here in the upcoming battle and process to nominate someone to the court. Plus, they can point to what happened in 2016 with Republicans' refusal to move forward on Merrick Garland's nomination. But what I think is complicated in this, though, is it's not clear cut to me if Republicans move really fast on this nomination, and it would be incredibly fast. We're 46 days away of the election as of Friday. On average, it lasts 50 days, setting aside, you know, what point we are in the election cycle. I'm not sure if Republicans want to get someone in immediately and then maybe risk voter turnout being depressed, right? If you get the court to the 6-3 majority, as a Republican voter, do I have the same incentive to turn out? I'm not sure Republicans will want to necessarily move as fastly on this as we think. So I want to unpack that a little bit. And I think here we're getting more into the electoral implications, which is you suggested, Sarah, that if Trump really wanted to you know, boost turnout amongst conservatives, he would maybe hold, nominate somebody, hold the hearings before election day, but hold off on actually confirming them in order to kind of dangle it as a prize for Republican voters. Theory seems a little too cute by half. It's a little okay, weird. Okay, tell us why. So one problem is, okay, let's say, like, first of all, if you're going to confirm, is a plan that you would dangle it, but then only confirm with the GOP keeps the Senate? Or do you confirm no matter what, right? Fair. Yeah, probably confirm no matter what. It then then right. it doesn't change anything. The only thing that right. would change is like, okay, let's say that um, you have the hearings, this nominee is moderately unpopular or moderately popular or whatever, right? Um, then comes November 3rd and Democrats win a big sweep. They win the presidency, they win the Senate. Um, they win, they keep the House, expand their majority, right? Um, so you just have this kind of national mandate on, among many other things, the Supreme Court, and then you kind of nominate somebody anyway in the lame duck session. I mean, that would seem to give Democrats a lot more leverage for like the, Fuck this, let's um, expand the court, let's add uh, Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C., let's end any type of filibuster whatsoever. Whether that plays out in the longer for Democrats or not, I don't know, right? But like, it seems... Like, you might be paying a price electorally in the long run. Maybe it's two years away from the next midterm, so who cares, right? But if you get a verdict from the public and the public kind of votes Democrats in office and then you nominate someone anyway, right? I mean, in some ways, it's like splitting the baby in ways that I don't understand why that's considered, like, such a smart strategy, really. No, the the only way you could really make it a live issue is to genuinely be, is to genuinely say... I don't think this too close to an election. I'm going to wait until after the election to nominate and confirm someone, not only after the election, but after the new Senate is is seated and say, American public, it's up to you. If you want me, President Trump, to have my choice of justices, keep Republicans in control of the Senate. Does That sounds farcical just saying it out loud, right? Um, right. But- and so... And it's kind of, I mean, I should point out, Trump has said on Twitter while we're recording this that he wants to move ahead forward now. Um, okay, so let's assume surprising. that that's, so let's assume that that is what happens. Republicans move forward with nominating and confirming someone before Election Day, and there is now a 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court. How does that affect the election? And let me just put this out there. It seemed like in 2016 that 
you know, a Supreme Court seat being on the ballot. Some suggest that helped Republicans, helped motivate religious conservatives who didn't necessarily like President Trump. Then in 2018, we saw with Kavanaugh that the race seemed to tighten someone at least where red states became redder, blue states became bluer, and Republicans uh, enhanced their majority in the Senate. So going into, you know, this process now, should we expect that a kind of raucous confirmation process will help Republicans? I think, uh, w- well, one, w- Nate, Nate should answer this, but we, we look, we should wait and see is, is the answer, right? Well, we should wait for polling, see how this all plays out. Wait not only for polling on the on the confirmation process, on whoever gets nominated, um, but for polling in, in all the Senate races and the presidential race to see how it all filters into the into the electoral sphere sphere. What I would say, though, is the idea that one having a, a hugely partisan fight right before the election helps Trump and Republicans does make a fair amount of sense to me, not because that fight in and of itself is particularly GOP friendly, but more that the status quo before the fight landed on the on the scene was particularly not GOP friendly. In other words, had had this Supreme Court seat not opened up before it opened up, we were in a Democratic leaning environment. Biden had uh, a big lead nationally over Trump and in most swing states. Um, the Republican control of the Senate was in doubt. Our forecast had it, you know, Democrats had slight, slight favorites to take control of the chamber. And so it's just like a question of if you were a Democrat on Thursday, you were feeling OK to pretty good about the about the 2020 elections. Now, if nothing else, there's this huge question mark. Right. So in that sense, it's well, bad for Democrats. And part of that is that it removes emphasis from COVID, which is what the election was being fought on. So we'll have to see if this if this proves to be true. But that's another part of this that I do think makes a fair amount of sense, which is just that Trump's mishandling of COVID, you know, the less attention that gets, the better for Trump. But isn't this way too pundity? I mean, look, look, people think about all the things that are different in your life right now because of COVID, right? Um, people you know who've gotten COVID or died from COVID, right? It's not like some media narrative focus that matters, right? It's not some political issue per se. It's an issue having to do with um, your everyday life, right? So like whether, you know, it's not clear to me that if the New York Times writes more front page articles about COVID, that that really kind of people are like, oh yeah, that COVID thing. I've forgotten about that. <laughs> I forgot even though I can't send my kids to school in half the country, even though I'm not going to my office, I can't go to a football game, right? I just forgotten about that COVID thing. You know, I mean, I don't know. Um, no, that's true. But also, but I don't know. That's the, that's the right answer. I don't know. But it, but it, I, on the margins, I think it could have an effect. Sure. But you're right that it's not like people forgot about COVID. Absolutely. Uh, Okay, well, then let's take 2016 or 2018 as examples where we actually have polling data, right? And maybe the most prominent example would be 2018, where it seemed to tighten races in red states where Democrats were incumbents, and ultimately a lot of them lost. A lot of the seats that Democrats are trying to pick up this time around are in Republican states, more or less, you know, Iowa, North Carolina, uh, Texas, even Montana. Wouldn't you, you know, if this is a a fiercely partisan fight that forces people into their corners to some extent, wouldn't that just have the same effect as 2018? I mean, that is at least somewhat of a data data driven um, understanding of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's not a bad prior, Um, although the map isn't as red as it was in 2018. Right. In 2018, you had races in. North Dakota and West Virginia and Indiana and places that are really Missouri that are really quite red. This year, it's more in places that are purple red. Um, like I don't think this is an easy issue for Steve Bullock, who is a Democrat in Montana. Um, you know, once you get to the really red states in South Carolina, although Lindsey Graham has uh, kind of pointedly at some point said, I "Even you can hold this against me, right?" But I would not do this if the situation were reversed. And obviously, he's, he's probably going to go ahead and be hypocritical. Lindsey Graham. How did we start this segment, Nate? 
I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, hypocrisy. It's, you know, everyone loves hypocrisy. It's hypocritical. It's all the rage. Not to love hypocrisy. It's all the rage. Well, what's been interesting, though, is we largely have thought of Supreme Court appointees as something that really motivates the GOP base. And while that's still true, like Democrats have moved a lot in recent years in terms of citing it as an important issue. And as Nate said, like, we're not going to forget that COVID's happening. But I was surprised that Pew found this year that the third most important issue was the Supreme Court among Americans. And so obviously now with this new development, I think that's going to change and make it even more important. But it's still really muddy and unclear to me how some of the, because both parties are increasingly motivated by the Supreme Court, how moving quickly on the appointment, if you're the GOP, will shift support and drive turnout versus what that would mean for Democrats, um, particularly in control of the Senate. I mean, as we're saying, it's a purple, it's a more purple map this year. But you know, will this help Gardner, who's underwater in the polls? Would this help McSally? I, I don't, I don't know. What about groups that haven't yet been activated? Like, does does this have the potential to turn non-voters into voters? And who would those people be? I'm very skeptical of that. Like that it would get a whole group of people off the sidelines. I don't, I don't know who that would be, right? Um, you know, you could... Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in an election when turnout is thought to be so high anyway, right? Um, you know, we're going to probably have record-breaking turnout anyway. We had crazy turnout in the midterm. Um, you know, I... Suppose if you look at if you compare registered voter and likely voter polls, um, so who are the people who are registered to vote but did not screen as likely to vote? Um, the likely voters are a tiny bit more Republican, maybe half a point to a point. Um, so in theory, if turnout increased based on that metric, then it's a tiny bit good for Democrats, but not like a huge split. But you know, there is polling that Democrats actually not consider the Supreme Court to be a more important issue than Republicans do. Um, it just if you're kind of already maxed out, right? Like, and which groups are Democrats struggling to turn out? It might actually be um, Black and Hispanic Democrats. So I would want to see what those groups think about um, the Supreme people? Court. Maybe it helps. Maybe it helps a little bit Democrats with um, Bernie-leaning younger voters, younger women who were maybe going to sit it out. But I don't think there were that many of those people. And likewise, for Republicans, I don't think there were very many like evangelicals who were going to really sit the election out necessarily. So I don't know. I think it's more the effect on on swing voters. So as we've mentioned here a bunch of times, as far as the politics are concerned, we're going to have to wait and see, even though we've proffered some hypotheses here. I think the last question, maybe the biggest question is how this changes the ideological makeup of the court. And I should mention our uh, legal reporter, Amelia Thompson DeVoe, is celebrating the holidays. So let's shout out to anybody who is celebrating the new year. Um, she will be back with us, I'm sure, soon. But Sarah, what sense do we have of, you know, who would become the new swing justice? How big of a difference this would be for the makeup of the court? Right. So with Ginsburg's absence, the reality is whether or not um, they fill the seat, you now have a 5-3 or 6-3. So Democrats need two votes from the GOP appointed justices to win a case. There will be no more like one swing vote. Um, if, you know, Trump moves ahead with someone like Barrett, then Kavanaugh is more so the median justice in the court. Well, him and Roberts in some form and combination, right? But that would mean then that that would be the new expectation going forward. Do Roberts and Kavanaugh side with the liberals on X issue? That could have real ramifications for the ACA, which was supposed to go before the court again this fall. And, you know, they'll also be settling any voting rights disputes among the states. And the Roberts Court has leaned more conservative on those rulings to date. So that will be another open question as that moves forward here in the election and could have real ramifications, particularly if we find ourselves in a Bush v. Gore situation as in 2000. 
Yeah, I mean, this is probably the the actual big story coming out of this. Um, any, if you look at any of the people Trump is likely to nominate, they would represent a huge ideological swing from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It will be not only the you know one less liberal on the court, one more conservative, but it will be you know a a one of the 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 liberal icons in the Supreme Court history um, being taken away in and being replaced with what I think we would expect to be a fairly far right um, nominee. I mean, if 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 only you look at at who Trump has nominated so far, he has not at all shown any inclination to go to moderate a moderate, right? Like like a Merrick Garland was was more of a moderate, um, even if even if he was left of center. Um, so it'll be it'll be a huge swing. As Sarah said, it could have it could have huge consequences for health care, for electoral law and, and what actually happens in 2020 abortion. Um, I mean, it's just like the list is endless and it and these are appointments for life. So it's it's the court was already somewhat out of whack with public opinion. Um, we could be heading towards a situation where let's say Biden wins in November. Um, let's say even say Democrats take the Senate. You might end up in a world where where you have this Supreme Court. Um, you know, someone in our meeting earlier today brought up, you know, the the court versus FDR in the 1930s, and there are differences there. But you could just have these big pitched battles between a really conservative court and a more left of center uh, government, um, and it it it'll be interesting. But it's it's if you're a conservative who cares about like jurisprudence in the U S you are like, you know, dancing on the moon today. I mean, it's, it's, you are very, very happy. It's, it's, it's quite, it'll be quite the shift. Um, I do think it's worth keeping in mind that although, um, these issues may seem very abstract now, a lot of the things that will be debated when a nominee is chosen will be, Roe v. Wade and the Affordable Care Act, um, and those are both issues on which there is a fair amount of electoral danger for Republicans, it would seem, right? I mean, I think you can absolutely credibly make the case that both those things would be under threat um, if a conservative nominee is chosen, and that's obviously kind of a feature and not a bug if you're a conservative. Um, but, you know, um, what is the nominee's stance on Roe v. Wade, right? If they are ambiguous, then maybe conservative legal scholars get cold feet, right? All right. Well, as I've said many times on this podcast, we are going to watch what plays out and we will have podcasts, emergency podcasts, as it all does play out. It's Honestly, it's been weird. It's kind of been a while since we've had an emergency podcast in some ways because most of 2020 has just been an emergency. So they've all been regular podcasts. Um, But uh, I imagine that we will have more at this point. So we'll be back with you this coming week. But let's leave it there for now. So thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Galen. And thank you, Micah. Thanks, guys. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Also, remember to subscribe to us on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.